right, so um, take it away, June. I guess uh, I should do an intro, but let's just go. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I really appreciate uh, all the online committee members for setting up this Zoom meeting and for allowing me to present this work. Um, I'm Jun Kato from IST, and this is a cooperative work with Keisuke, who is the interaction designer, uh, the president of the Oton Glass Company, and a PhD student at uh, Keio University in Japan. Um, so today's talk is titled Rethinking Programming Environment uh, with a bracket enclosing the term environment. And as the title suggests, my talk deals with the environment surrounding a programmer and not merely a programming language or toolkit design. To provide concrete context to the topic, I first um, introduce my prior work on programming environment design. And then I'd like to uh, move on to introduce our effort to make a program environment more collaborative and more inclusive. So um, before discussing how to design improved programming environments, uh, let me briefly introduce some of my prior work to examine the design space of programming environment design. And um, so each of these is a toolkit ID extensions and API for programs that run in the real world. And every one of these is part of the program environment design. The first example is Fibots, which is a toolkit to make robotic things. And um, as you can see in this demo video, the toolkit eases the development of robotic, ro robotic applications that handle uh, two dimensional locomotion tasks on a single plane. And uh, it is a toolkit and it abstracts such tasks and provides a runtime debugger for analyzing the program behavior. The second example is Deja Vu, an IDE with extensions named Canvas and Timeline um, that eases the development of interactive camera-based programs. The programmer can actually um, drag and drop variables from the code editor to the canvas to visualize its variable content during the runtime of the programs. And the environment also recalls the uh, changes in the values during the runtime. So it allows the programmers to replay the executions afterwards, um, like the sessions are shown in this list. Uh, the third example is Songul Sync, uh, which is a toolkit to synchronize various kinds of physical computing devices um, with internet connectivity to music playback. Um, and um, it can actually control various kinds of devices like, you know, like this shown in this video. Um, and it's under active development. So if you're interested, um, you can just go to this website. Um, and so there are of course other projects that I've worked for, uh, but the point is that all of these are part of the programming environment. The design space is really huge and they span among uh, programming language, software engineering, um, and human computer interaction research fields. So um, as a short summary, uh, designing a program environment can take various forms of implementation. And um, it is all about uh, creating comfortable programming ex experience for programmers. Um, so as the last example, um, F3.js uh, is a program environment that helps people to develop physical computing devices um, like uh, those shown in these photos, like you know, game devices, musical instruments, um, you know, other kinds of internet of things devices. Um, and it is designed for both programmers and designers, uh, both programmers and users, which I will explain later. The motivation behind this work is pretty simple. The emerging personal fabrication technologies such as uh, 3D printers and laser cutters, um, they really ease people to create physical objects. And they're also uh, easy to use sensor and actual modules. Um, and they are really easy to use and they often doesn't require soldering to build a customized um, physical computing devices. But actually there is, um, comparatively little discussion on how to help people develop programs and also design the appearance of the devices, uh, how to assemble the device, the final device. 
uh, conventionally speaking, uh, the programmer writes uh, software with IDEs such as uh, Arduino IDE and designs the enclosure with uh, computer-aided design software uh, as shown on the right side. Um, so different tools and expertise are needed uh, for software and hardware design. And this results in a substantial mental gap uh, between these two. So for instance, uh, when the programmer writes new button um, like this, um, if we develop GUI applications, we expect that a button appears, but um, actually in this kind of physical computing device world, uh, it doesn't infer any hardware layout. Um, and uh, the programmer needs to define um, this kind of layout from scratch um, in a CAD tool. So to address this issue, S3JS allows the programmer to write a single piece of code that defines not only the firmware, but also, um, also the enclosure layout. And the key components of S3JS are the module repository um, and APIs for the enclosure layout and the live program editor. Um, I think it's a little bit complex, so let me just show a live demo of this environment. So as a programmer, um, you can navigate to this kind of code editor uh, that you, you should be familiar with. And um, if you look into the source code, um, it requires a device driver like this. Um, it is a driver for a Buza device. And um, if you look into the code, um, you know, it instantiates the Buza device like this and um, set volume. And in the end, I think um, it will, you know, play sound um, at some point. And interesting thing is that it's, all, it's not only defining the firmware, but also the enclosure layout, which is shown on the right side. So um, here it says number of Buza is three. Um, you can change it to four. And you see that the enclosure layout is changed. And of course, since this is the firmware also, um, it affects uh, the behavior of this application uh, at the same time. Um, and um, for your convenience, if you define this special comment in the code editor, uh, you see this interactive sliders or whatever, um, which is actually bound to this variable declaration. So you can change the value to two to see that um, there are only two boosters here. You can, of course, change it to three to see it three. And in the end, you can download the, um, uh, the enclosure layer, which can be directly sent to the uh, laser cutter as a PDF file. Or, uh, well, I can, of course, open it. Or, um, let's see, you can download the program that can be installed to the uh, microcontroller. So this is the basic idea of how F3JS helps programmers to build uh, physical computing devices from scratch, utilizing the single code base. Uh, so this is the code editor for the programmer uh, with live programming support. And um, so, yeah, these are the example design of the existing program environments. And as you can see, um, they consist of various computational tools for bu building and debugging programs and uh, actually specifically designed for programmers. So this is the background part. And um, now I'd like to move on to how we can improve uh, the program environment to be more collaborative and inclusive. And the first part uh, would discuss the technical gap between the programming environment and the runtime environment. Um, as shown in this figure, um, program environments are usually different from runtime environments, right? Uh, programmers uh, write code, and sometimes it has this kind of you know, fancy live programming support, but in the end, the compiled programs are passed to the uh, end user, and they just run the program. So um, programmers develop programs and publish them, and users install apps and use them. So once published, the programs cannot be edited. Um, actually, there are some environments uh, that deliver source code instead of compiled programs and allow users to remix them to fit their needs. And a notable example is uh, Scratch, uh, as shown in this slide. Um, and while I like this open source approach supported in the environment design level, these program environments are still designed exclusively for programmers. 
So the users of the programs are expected to have the same level of expertise in programming as programmers, uh, the original programmers, uh, the programmers of the original program. So my proposal is to design the environment to fit both programmers and users uh, without losing its hurt. So uh, the em environment actually shares the source code between the programmers and the users. Um, and so instead of compiled programs, source code is shared, but actually the users face the dedicated user interfaces without this kind of you know, text-based code editor, for example. Um, they benefit from a respective UI design and as a result, they can safely edit the programs without breaking them. Um, again, to show the concrete example, let me go back to the demonstration of the F3JS environment. Uh, so this was the view for the programmer, right? And for this musical instrument device, actually there is, there is this web page designed for users who might not have the prior experience of programming. So they can look at these fancy photos and descriptions and you know, they can look at these demo videos, but then here they can see that, okay, the enclosure layout will look like this. There are three boozers here. And they see these sliders, they can, they, you know, they might not be able to edit the code, but they can manipulate these sliders. So if they want five boosters, they can change the slider to five. Um, if they want to change the default volume, um, you know, they can change the default volume like this. Um, and, you know, um, since this environment actually defines every aspect of the device, uh, it also generates this building instructions dynamically. Um, now they see that uh, they need five group boosters to build this device, so they might want to purchase a device um, by navigating this page, or um, you know, they also get this PDF file, which is actually the same as the previous one, but um, now I think there are five boosters here, right? Um, five um, you know, ports for holding the um, boosters. Mm. And then finally, they have this uh, tar file that can be installed to the device instantly. So um, let's see. This interaction design um, is named live tuning and is designed for users as opposed to live programming intended for programmers. And they can actually get a customized variation of the uh, program definition by utilizing this kind of graphical user interfaces. Um, let me go back to the demo again. So now that they can customize the device, what if they want to modify the device spec um, beyond, the, beyond the scope of these parameters? Actually, there is this plus button and they can propose customization. So um, let's see. Uh, the user might want to change the tone of the user. I don't know, uh, whatever. Um, and they can propose it and commit this proposal. Uh, I think, I think it, okay. So now you get this mock-up UI for changing the tone of, tone of the boozer. And um, as the developer, actually, I think my smartphone rings. Um, I, I got this notification from Twitter. Um, F3JS environment is actually tightly bound to the uh, Twitter uh, account. And um, I get the notification. So as a programmer, uh, starting from now, um, I navigate to this page and uh, click the edit button. Uh, and to go to the source code of this uh, device. And now um, if I scroll down to the bottom of the source code, there is this mockup variable declaration, right? Um, there is this random number um, numbered uh, variable and it says proposed variable, which is a tone of the user. So if I know how to implement it, um, I can, you know, implement it and remove this proposed comment. 
to make it actually works, right? But now I don't have time to actually implement the feature, so I just remove it and update it. So if I go back to the previous page, uh, you know, the mockup UI is gone. But I think you can, you, you, you got the basic idea, right? Um, this interaction design is named user-generated variables, and here a variable is actually serving as a communication medium between a programmer and a user. So as a summary of our technical environment design, we took a multi-layered uh, user interface design approach. The multi-layered UI was uh, first uh, explained by Ben Schneiderman in 2002 for the improved usability um, of the applications. And here we apply it to the environment design, separating the base layer for the programmers and uh, from the other layer for users. And this can also be thought of as an example of the application of the uh, meta design framework. Um, programmers are meta designers who define the degree of freedom to customize the program behaviors and uh, users are the designers who customize the programs to fit their needs. And as a result, uh, program environments become social technical systems uh, with which diverse kinds of people can collaborate to improve the program definitions uh, collaboratively. In the previous slides, I have introduced the social feature built into the F3.js uh, environment, uh, technically enabling collaboration between people uh, with diverse technical backgrounds. And uh, from now on, I'd like to follow up on some of the limitations of the technical approach. And actually, uh, please note that this part is really an ongoing effort and could have rough discussions without definite uh, conclusions. So I'd appreciate feedback such as um, you know, pointing to re relevant references um, and so on. So as shown in this talk, a program environment such as F3.js is usually designed to consist of computational artifacts uh, such as uh, software components um, or you know, the database or um, you know, abstractions gained from the uh, domain-specific knowledge or some sort of, you know, these kind of things. And as a computer scientist, uh, designing the environment in that way, uh, I mean, the, designing the environment to be consistent of uh, computational artifact is, 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 you know, seems pretty straightforward. And benefit of such a merely technical approach is that it's really scalable. Uh, various information technology related innovations have benefited, benefited from the scalability enabled by the computational backend. So for instance, uh, F3.js, in the case of F3.js, it's a web-based service, so it can be served via the internet and the dynamically generated uh, instructions, building instructions, for example, allow users to learn basic concepts of physical computing uh, programming by themselves. Uh, but I would like to note that the technical approach of computational support sometimes falls short um, of social inclusion, making it difficult to be used by some people with a particular characteristic. So for, for instance, F3.js is not designed uh, for uh, people with visual impairment and they would face difficulties when building the devices. So in the context of uh, personal fabrication research, it has been already pointed out that uh, people with disabilities often have difficulty in, in utilizing this kind of um, enabling technologies, personal fabrication technologies. Um, this sentence uh, highlighted in yellow reads like this. Um, Despite the use of the DIY acronym, uh, people with disabilities have been framed as primarily users or consumers rather than producers of uh, DIY assistive technologies, uh, which is in short DIY ATs. So as the last example of a program environment design, I'd like to introduce our ongoing effort to implement social inclusion. Um, so um, this is a smart glasses built with a 3D printer and Raspberry Pi. Um, and Keisuke, the second author, first made it as a personal device uh, for the father who acquired, who acquired dyslexia, uh, which is about the difficulty to read text. Um, and so the device has a built-in camera and internet connectivity. When the first father pushes the button, it sends the captured image to the server and uh, the server returns the synthesized voice that reads text contained in the picture. And uh, while this project started as a personal device, uh, since it consists of off-the-shelf devices and off-the-shelf software, it was actually straightforward to build a toolkit uh, that aids the development of uh, smart glasses with similar features. So we built an Autumn Glass toolkit um, 
a set of APIs and hardware components and wanted to make variations of the Auton Glass device. And actually, these kind of variations are pretty important for people with visual impairment because uh, they have a variety of symptoms and have different preferences. Uh, it's really essential to enable such customization by uh, each, uh, each person with visual impairment. However, as discussed earlier, uh, people with visual impairment have general difficulties when building physical devices. So to this end, uh, we decided to form a support team for each user with visual impairment, and we call the supporters evangelists. Um, and the evangelist is a person who knows how to use the toolkit um, and help the youth, helps the user build customized smart glasses. And as a result, uh, three teams of the evangelists and makers were formed and developed their own glasses. Um, this video shows the uh, case studies. Uh, for the first case, uh, the architect with a progressive disease teamed up with the interaction designer and designed the auton glass in the pen form. Um, the device is in a pen form and can be detached from the glasses and be held in hand, um, enabling the zapping experience, like you know, just you know, pointing it to an arbitrary place. And the second case was a team of um, visually impaired Paralympian, uh, the helper, and evangelist. So the Paralympian proposed to add a voice chat feature and turn this device into actually a communication device between the Paralympian and the uh, helper. And the third case was a team of visually impaired engineer and they built APIs on top of the existing toolkit. So they hacked the uh, toolkit by themselves and built several example applications that you know, exposes the usage of their APIs. Um, you know, the, the example applications include this kind of photo sharing applications and you know, music player applications and, and so on. So in this project, um, we consider that the evangelist who communicate with the programmer or maker and help using the toolkit is an essential part of the program environment. So in addition to the computational artifacts such as IDEs, toolkits, and program languages, uh, we propose to design a program environment as a hybrid of technical and social implementations. And um, then the essential part of program environment design is a sort of community design um, rather than inventing a simple technical solution. And as a result, program activities inherently involve communication between diverse kinds of people. So as a summary of our social environment design, uh, we consider that, um, uh, sorry, we consider that uh, it's a programming by a community of people rather than a single programmer or a group of pr programmers. And a program environment would consist of not only computational artifacts, but also a community of people uh, to collaborate to develop software, just as we observe in this open source community. And uh, it was interesting to see uh, discussions between participants yesterday uh, in, this, in this salon, the people are message passing objects, right? Uh, instead of setting up local program environments, an end user might ask another user to do the stuff, making them uh, serve as a sort of a function that takes arguments and returns return values. And my understanding is that uh, such an idea can be actually built into the program environment design, um, just as the crowdsourcing platform um, enables people to, you know, function as the uh, functions. It can be called as a functions from the programs. And um, so as a... As an ongoing work, um, I think we need to explore the idea of programming as communication for future work. Um, programming is not a standalone activity anymore and should be a form of communication to exchange ideas between people. And so compared to the tailor-made model, for example, um, in the previous exa example, the programmer with visual impairment produces ideas and decides what to build. So the uh, programming activity inher inherently involves communication and uh, enables actually the empowerment uh, of themselves. Um, so I believe that this kind of empowerment uh, is really important in the future of uh, convivial computing. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to emphasize the importance of programming experiment, experience research. And so 
Literally speaking, a program environment surrounds a programmer and provides a programming experience. And designing a more inclusive programming experience is essential to the goal of convivial, convivial computing. And programming environments are usually designed exclusively for programmers, but can be and should be more inclusive. And to do that, uh, we explored two approaches. Uh, the first approach is to share it among uh, programmers and users uh, by exposing uh, different levels of the user interfaces, different ladders of the abstractions to the um, different kinds of people with diverse technical backgrounds. And this is really a kind of technical solutions um, and it can be you know, categorized into a kind of light programming research. Um, but the other one is uh, about um, designing the program environment as a hybrid of people uh, and computational artifacts. And it's, it's not purely a programming uh, experience or technical research, but it's more like the sociology or, uh, you know, a more social effort. And I think both of these are really important as, and essential for uh, making the program environment uh, more inclusive and um, collaborative and inviting more kinds of people expose their creativity uh, through programming. So I think that's all from my slides. Um, so thank you for listening. Thanks, June. Thank you.